Today, we're continuing our series, One Anothering, where we're looking at what it is to love our brothers and sisters in Christ well. And that is what we are called to as the body of Christ. We are to love one another. And unfortunately for some of you, maybe many of you, your experience with the church isn't a community that loves well, but instead a community that, that maybe hurts well. For many of you, your experience in the church was that you came uh, and felt either ashamed, rejected, uh, abused, whatever it may be, and then maybe have left the church. I know some of you, your story was that that was what your experience with the church was. You left the church for a period of time, months, years, decades, and then have re-entered into it uh, to find, amongst other things, the community of God that will share and extend the love of God. And so today, as we continue this, this series, it's important we take a moment just to look back last week. Pastor Jason and Heather uh, spent some time unpacking what it is to receive and experience the love of God. Because if we are to expend the love of God, we first have to receive it. And before we jump into today's passage, if you have your Bibles, be in Romans 12, starting in verse 9. Before we jump in there, I do want to spend just a second looking at the words of Jesus himself, found in John 13, 35. He says, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Jesus' call for the church is for us to love one another, for us to live out the mission. This is one of the ways we live out the mission of taking the gospel to a lost and hurt world, that we love one another within the church. So we're going to be spend the rest of our time in Romans 12, uh, verse 9 through 13. It says, let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Here we find Paul writing about how do we actually now live out this love that God has shown to us. And in his writing, what we're going to see is that he kind of goes back and forth, back and forth, how we experience and kind of dwell in his love, let it build up within us, and then how do we extend it? And so we're going to kind of bounce around this passage, kind of sticking with uh, how he formats those thoughts. And what we're going to look at first is that love, our extending love, has to begin inward. Right? Again, kind of building on what we discussed last week, that to extend love, we first receive and experience love. He starts off with this passage saying, let love be genuine, that we are called to love one another, and our love is to be a genuine extension of the love we received. Right? The word in Greek for genuine is literally unhypocritical. We are, to be, we are not to be hypocritical in extending love. And so for that to happen, the first thing we have to do is receive God's love and experience it. And last week, this word love, again, is agape. We defined it as an unconditional, affectionate desire for someone's best that leads to self-sacrificial action. That we have to receive God's agape love, which was shown in its perfect form through Jesus Christ, who gave up heaven, came down to earth, was tortured and beaten and died upon the cross, taking the sins of all of our sins upon himself so that we can be uh, redeemed and re- our relationship with God reunified. And so for us to extend love, it has to begin with our receiving that pure, genuine form of love through Jesus Christ. And then he goes on to say, as you're loving, you have to like adopt the mindset, the character of God. Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good, because this is going to shape how we love others. Right? This is how God views both evil and good. He hates evil. He loves Good, and that is how he then acts and, and loves us as well. 
Last week we talked about, or Pastor Jason and Heather talked about what it is to hold fast to good. Really, how do we do that? We experience God's love. And so I'm not going to unpack it a lot today, just kind of point back to what they discussed last week. How do we hold fast to what is good? We abide, we experience his love. And they gave uh, really four ways to do that. The first one, reflect upon the cross. Uh, Second, uh, be in Christian community. Third, to have regular rhythms of relationship with God. And then Heather talked about just dwelling and and enjoying his blessings. For her, that was a rainy day, while for some of you, it may be the opposite, a beautiful, sunny, hot, warm day to be outside in. Now, the opposite of this is not that just we just abide in his love and in his goodness, but we adopt his mindset in which we abhor evil. We abhor evil. And there's a man, uh, John Chrysostom. He is an early church father, hugely influential in the church, kind of expounded on Paul's writing here. He said, and he does not, that's Paul, speak of refraining from it, but of hating it and not merely hating it, but hating it exceedingly that this is our mindset that we have to adopt to all things evil. And when I say that, it's not just the evil that is around us, the evil that other people do, the evil we see in the world, but really the evil that exists inside of us and through our actions. We are called to hate it. And really when I look at his explanation of abhorring evil, it's like a hate where I want to put evil in my life to death. And this is important because if we're going to extend love, we can't dabble in evil because the more we dabble in evil, the more it changes how we will extend our actions, which the more evil we do, the less likely we are to extend love and extend instead extend evil itself. So how do we go about practically hating evil? Because this isn't just like, hey, have a mindset that says evil is bad. Because I think by and large, if you're in the church, you've probably already adopted that mindset. But we have to uh, hate evil in a practical way. So how do we hate evil? Three ways that I just want us to spend some time discussing. The first one is to repent. That if we are going to hate evil, we're going to hate the evil in our lives, we need to repent of that evil. That is, we need to acknowledge our actions and our thoughts, acknowledge the hurt that it causes ourselves and other people and ultimately God and turn away from it. Turn away from it and seek out God. Seek him to change us through the indwelling Holy Spirit. We have to be a people who repent. And I know often in the church, right, sometimes repentance has become a really harsh, dirty word for some people because we have attached that and made it to be something it never was. Repentance has, goes hand in hand with guilt, right? We feel guilt over the sin that we commit and then we acknowledge the wrongness of it and turn back to God. And unfortunately, sometimes for some people, what repentance has mean is it has to do with shame, which is taking guilt a step further. Instead of recognizing our actions for the wrong they are, we take it further than that and we start to feel shame for it because we assign our actions as our identity. I'm not someone who stole, I'm a thief. I'm not someone who committed adultery. I am an adulterer. And then when we do that, we lose, or at least we do not live in the identity that Christ has for us. Our identity is found in Christ and not our sin. But we do need to repent. We need to seek out and eradicate sin through our life. And one of the ways we do that is repent. So do you have a regular rhythm in your life of repentance? that we were forgiven through Christ, but we are still called to identify sin in our life, turn away from it and turn to God. The second thing is we can seek accountability, that we have been placed in Christian community for a lot of reasons. And one of those things that we can find in Christian community is accountability, that we find brothers or sisters in Christ, that we meet with regularly, that we we share the sin in our life, not just to share, to celebrate it or to, to merely just like uh, throw it and spew it out of our mouths, but really so that we can have somebody we are accountable to, someone who will encourage us in righteousness, who will call out our sin, whether we acknowledge it or not, somebody who will say, you have this sin or evil in your life and I want to support you in overcoming it. So that we, are, we should always be seeking out accountability. And this can be very difficult because accountability is really, really uncomfortable. 
So we have to ask ourselves, what do we hate more? Do we hate evil? Or are we more concerned with hating feeling uncomfortable? I think Paul makes it very clear that we should hate evil at a level that we're going to put aside our discomfort and seek out ways to rid ourselves of the evil. The last one that I want to share today is to remove avenues of sin. Remove avenues remove avenues of evil in our life. That if we're to hate sin at such a level that we want to destroy it in our lives, we would be wise to find the reasons or the objects or the environments or the people in our lives that lead us to sin. Ultimately, we're responsible for sin, but the reality is there are things in our life that make it very, very easy for us to sin. One of those ways that an evil that I see in our society, in our culture, that has unfortunately uh, hurt our church much has, is, is pornography. This is an evil that a lot of people now say is, is good or acceptable. And it is crushing us and it is shaping how we love the people around us. Do you, if you have an issue with, say, pornography, are you willing to view it for the evil it is and then seek out to eradicate it? And how that looks with this step is, right, pornography takes place with something else. It's often a computer or a laptop or a phone. Are you going to now take that avenue of sin and do something about it? Because every time or often when you go to it, it leads to an evil. Will you put a program, Covenant Eyes or something similar on your computer? Will you just, if it's the computer, will you get rid of the computer at your home? Or maybe, maybe it's that little phone, that smartphone in your pocket that makes it so easy to drift and to engage in sin. Will you get rid of that? And I know for a lot of people, that's like the biggest extreme possible to get rid of our smartphone because it's such a, such a commonplace item in our life. But if that's what's causing you to sin, what's that's what's leading you to sin, will you get rid of it? For most of human history, we got along just fine. I would actually argue we got along better without it in our pockets than we do today. Will you hate evil at such an extreme you would get rid of a commonplace item as a computer or a smartphone? Or maybe that smartphone itself isn't, isn't about pornography. Maybe it's about social media Something that it often, research shows, leads us to committing evil thoughts, to actually committing evil actions. And will you delete Instagram or Twitter or whatever new social media is out there? I can't keep up with it. Will you remove that from your life? Because it is an easy avenue for you to fall into sin, for you to fall into evil. Paul says, if we're going to love well, We not only engage in the goodness and the love of God, but we seek out and eliminate and hate evil in our lives because those two things are going to shape our thoughts and actions about and how we treat the people around us. He's going to continue on in this inward. He's going to jump ahead a couple verses. Verse 11, he says, Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. Again, as he's talking about how we live out, extend God's love, how we're not a cul-de-sac, but a conduit, he comes back to, again, this idea of how do we experience that love and then engage it internally, uh, feed it internally so it actually comes out in action. Do not be slothful in zeal. Have a burning fire, a desire, a mission in your heart to extend love and do not be slothful about it. Our extending love should be something we are not reactive and just allow it to happen, but something we choose daily to pursue just with an incredible zeal. He goes, says to be fervent in spirit. Now there's a lot of debate, this word spirit. Is this our spirit? Is it the Holy Spirit that indwells us? All right, and there's a lot of evidence that points both ways. And for me, what I would say is those things, when you are indwelled by the Holy Spirit, they are so connected. I think it can be both. And the word here, fervent, in the original Greek means literally to boil. To boil like a pot of water, boiling a pot of water. We are to boil our spirit. We're to boil the Holy Spirit, 
Like it's vivid imagery. Every, uh, <laughs> twice a week, almost every week, I cook in the morning oatmeal for my family. I put the pot on the stove, I turn on the heat, and what inevitably happens, right, no matter how much I want to stay on top of it, as soon as I turn it away, that pot of oatmeal of water just boils over. And Paul's saying, live like that. Engage the empowering spirit. Uh, Fuel your own spirit. Just allow it to boil over in acts of love, which is served and ultimately serving the Lord. We serve God by serving and loving others. And he writes on, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. Three ways, three ways in which we just feed that fire, that, that, that we feed that boiling of the spirit, engaging in love so that we can extend it. Rejoice in hope that we look to the promises of Christ, that he came and died so that we could be presented as justified and then in that we have an eternal future hope. We are heirs to the kingdom. We have eternal life. And someday we will have a reward in heaven. And when it's not really clear fully what that means, but ultimately that we for all eternity get to be with Christ. He says, be patient in tribulation. If we want to live out this love, if we want to kind of boil that that spirit that moves us towards love, we are patient in tribulation. We persevere through the difficulties of life that come because we have chosen to follow Christ. He's really pointing back to what he wrote about chapters earlier in Romans 5, 3 through 5. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. That as we persevere for sufferings, tribulations, persecutions, one of the things it does is it produces in us character, the character of God. Often we would look at those things as the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The first is love. If we're going to engage in the empowering Holy Spirit, we persevere through sufferings, patience, and tribulation. And finally, he says, be constant in prayer that we are to engage in relationship with a good, loving, holy, perfect God, both speaking to him and listening for his direction in our life. And in doing this, we just feed that fire within us so that we will live like he lived, self-sacrificial, sacrificing himself for the betterment of others. All of this, he continues to look internally because internal change will lead to external action. There's a couple things he highlights in this short passage. The first one is familial love. How do we love well? We adopt this idea of familial love. He says, verse 10, love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. This word love here is this Greek word. It's really actually a mashing together of two words. It's philostorgos. And it is two words, right? The first one, philos, is this idea of love, but in the sense of friendship, like the affection I have for my friends around me with the word storgus, which is this word that is a familial affection. He mashes them together and says, that's how you are to love one another. The body of Christ isn't just to view each other as these people with a loose relationship simply because we all believe in Christ, but instead we are to literally love each other like a family at a level that goes far beyond anything we would see uh, in normal human friendship relationships. It says you are to love one another like brothers and sisters in Christ. And I know for some of you, that's a really hard idea to wrap your head around because it's not what you experienced. Your home of origin was not one that was loving. The idea of like a family love that goes beyond anything is not what you experienced. Or maybe for your extended family, it wasn't one that viewed uh, the family like that because they were constantly at each other's throats. But I think it's one that we often uh, experience or at least hear about in culture. We have a saying, blood is thicker than water. And it's that idea that we, we love each other beyond just liking each other because we are a true family in Christ. 
We choose to love each other, whether we like somebody or, or, or enjoy spending time with them. We love each other as though they are truly our family. And then he goes on beyond that. You are to outdo one another in showing honor. Paul writes, the only time as a follower of Christ you are to be in competition with your brothers and sisters in Christ is when you are trying to outdo each other in loving each other well. That you guys should have, we as the church family, we should have a type of friendly rivalry with one another in which we are outdoing one another in loving. For those of you who have participated in sports, you may have an idea of this. I got to experience it multiple times through my time playing both hockey and wrestling. Teammates who we were on the same team and our ultimate goal was to go to a game and win that game, to beat the other team. But during practice, even though we were buddies, even though we played well together, there was like a love-hate relationship. In practice, we were so hard on each other. We would push each other to the edge and beyond. We would beat each other up. We would, we would encourage each other. We would, we would do whatever we could because we wanted that person to be the best they could be. And we would push each other again and again and again so that practice sometimes felt harder than the game. And it's that kind of rivalry that Paul encourages us to take. You should be pushing each other to greater acts of love your mindset with your brothers and sisters in Christ is when they love me or when they don't love me, I'm going to love them back even harder than they can imagine. And this call that he has for us and how we are to love one another, right? If we live this out, if the church truly lived this out where our mindset was, we're going to one up each other constantly in love, it would be transformational. I, can, I don't even know that I can imagine what it would look like at its end. But what I do know is when we come anywhere close to this, what the church does is it, 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 is it just, it is a beacon to the lost. People who are not part of the church cannot help but look and say, there is something different. I want to be a part of that. When you look at the, the church in Acts, the new church in Acts, this is what they did. They spent day after day seeing how can I love somebody better than I loved them before. And it just brought people in droves into the church. They said, I want to know what's going on in there. I want to be a part of that because that's nothing like I've ever experienced. This is, again, how we live out the mission. We love each other in this like competition to outdo one another in love, honor, and respect. The next thing he talks about is extreme hospitality. Again, he goes back and he talks about how we just boiled up this love inside of us and then we pour it out. And he talks about doing this in extreme hospitality. He says, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Now this word saints, for some of you may come with some baggage, particularly if you're like me, you grew up in the Catholic church and the saints were these uh, best of the best Christians who performed miracles and, and the church chose to give this title. But when Paul or any of the New Testament writers write about saints, they're just referring to any follower of Christ. So what he's calling us to is to contribute to the needs of of the church body, contribute to any of the brothers and sisters in Christ. This is how we love. That love isn't just this feeling of affection, although it starts there. It's not just this, hey, I have good vibes towards you. It's I'm going to actually love you in action. That is the call. Not just love them in thought or in word, but in action. And we do that by meeting each other's needs. Last week, uh, Sunday, I got the witnesses. It was like perfect timing. I'm preparing this sermon for this Sunday. And, and Sunday, I get to witness this in action. It's Sunday morning. Uh, we're getting out of bed. My wife, Jamie, she receives a message from one of the families in our church, uh, a husband and wife. And the wife reaches out to her and says, hey, can we get some help? Last night, her husband had, had fallen as he had got up uh, in the middle of the night. He is recovering from cancer and surgery and chemotherapy. He got up, he fell over, and she struggled to get him up. And she said, part of the reason it was so difficult is because of the layout of our bedroom. We need a bed and some dressers move. We can't do it ourselves. Is there any way we could get some help? 
And so Jamie passes that along to me as I head to church because she has to stay home with a sick kid. And I get to church and as people start pouring in, right, I go up to three different friends within the church, brothers in Christ, and say, hey, we have uh, someone from our church in need. They need help moving stuff. Is there any way we could do this immediately following church? And every one of them had plans. And every one of them said, I don't care about my plans. Some of us, one of our people's in need, we're going to meet that need. They dropped everything they had. They went over there. They took care of these people. And what was so beautiful, some of the guys, they knew them. Some didn't. They knew of them. They knew they were part of our church. And because of that, they were going to do everything they could to help this family out. And that is what they did. That is meeting the needs of the saint in action. This is what we are called to do daily, continually throughout our our lives is to meet each other's needs. And what I see by and large as I share that is that mostly, not perfectly, but mostly is what I experience at family church. I see a group of people who are committed to caring for one another as best they can. But what Paul writes about is is going a step beyond that. This doesn't just end within the building or the doors of family church or individual campuses. What he is calling us to is to extend this to all brothers and sisters of Christ, whether they're part of our local church or the church of our, somewhere in our, our city or our state or across the world. He goes on and says, seek to show hospitality. And the depth of this is lost in there with that word hospitality. It, it does mean hospitality. But I think for a lot of us, when we think of hospitality, we've reduced it to this American version, which means I'm going to have someone over to my house for whatever reason. And I'm going to mostly show them hospitality by cleaning my house to a level where they will have unrealistic expectations of how we live. What hospitality is, is meeting people's needs. But this word in Greek carries some deep meaning because it too, like the first word of this passage, is a mashing together of two Greek words. It is philo exenia. The first part, philo, again, this love, this friendship, love. And the second part, xenia, is like stranger or foreigner or alien. It is a call to love the foreigner like you love the people that you are friends with, the people in your local church. And Paul is writing this in the middle of the the diaspora, the the dispersion of the church because they are being hunted down. They are being kicked out of their houses. They are truly being persecuted because of their belief and they're being spread across the known world. And he's writing to the church saying, those brothers and sisters in Christ who you do not know, you are called to take care of them as well. Not just the ones you like, not just your friend group, not the ones that maybe you see going to another house church, but all of the brothers and sisters in Christ, you shouldn't view as strangers who you should be wary of, but instead like long lost brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles and sons and daughters and fathers and mothers. They are your people, regardless of whether you knew them and you should love them with a deep love that says, I'm going to meet your need which for them at that moment meant bringing them into the house, giving them a place to live, feeding them, clothing them, giving them a, 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 maybe even a job. It says we are to love not just our local church, our local brothers and sisters, but all brothers and sisters. Do we love the people in this building the same as we're going to go ahead and love the other churches in our town? The other churches in our town that maybe we disagree with how they go about doing things or their particular beliefs around a, a, a point in theology. We're called to love them the same as we love each other in this building. And he says, right, we're contribute to the needs. We are to seek to show hospitality. This idea of seeking, it's to pursue it. It's not this passive, I'm going to show hospitality when it falls on my lap and everything works out. It is to adopt a mindset that says, I am going to meet people's needs. I am going to make it my personal mission to find people, brothers and sisters in need, and meet that need with extreme vigilance. That is our calling. That is our calling to extend love. And what's so great about all of this is it's not just simply for the betterment of the church. It is that. It is a way for each and every one of us as followers of Christ to extend God's love so that we can experience God's love. 
But what Paul writes about after this, and we're not going to jump into, but as he writes about this, he then kind of changes, he changes it a little bit. He talks about how do we love each other well, and he naturally flows into, now that you're doing this with each other, as you do this with each other, you are to love the lost people around you. He writes about them very harshly. He even says the enemies, the people who you consider enemies, you're then to love them the same way, to extend hospitality, to meet their needs, to love them while they hate you. That this is how we live out the mission of sharing the gospel. This is how, as we love one another, people take notice of it. They want to come a part of it. And as we practice loving each other well, the natural outflow of that is we will begin to love the lost people around us well. I'm going to go ahead and release the campus pastors. Love you guys. Thanks for sticking around our transformational moment today. Uh, Are you allowing evil in your life? We talked uh, a little bit in depth about how important it is that we adopt this mindset of hating evil of hating evil because the evil that we allow to be in our lives, to shape our lives, it will shape how we love. So are you allowing evil in your life? And if you are, I would say probably where you are because none of us are perfect. What are you doing to actively hate that, to remove it, to seek it out, to destroy it, and instead fill that space with the love of God so that we can extend it? And then with that, a challenge for you today. For this week, really all time moving forward, look for opportunities to be hospitable, to meet people's need, both the brothers and sisters in Christ that you know, or maybe the brothers and sisters in Christ that you just happen to come in contact with. Look for, seek out those opportunities and extend that love of Christ that we are called to. Have a great day.